Next up, we have the, uh, the economics of sport. Uh, Dr. Steve Davis is the Education Director at the IEA. Previously, he was the Program Officer at the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University in Virginia. He joined IHS from the UK, where he was Senior Lecturer in the Department of History and Economic History at Manchester Metropolitan University. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Grant. Well, uh, I'm going to talk, as you've just heard, about the economics of sport. Now, quite a lot you can say about that, and quite a lot of different things you can talk about. You can use economics to explain why it is, for example, that all kinds of bad stuff like Man United winning the title year after year happened. Uh, but you can also uh, use different kind of things. What I want to talk about here is essentially to use the Hayekian insights about the nature of spontaneous order to help us understand something about sport, which is the way in which organized sport actually historically appeared and the way in which a whole series of complex institutions arose. And the interesting contrast here is with the political sphere and the modern state. Now, um, organized sport's a major feature of the modern world, of modern life. Uh, it's one of those subjects that is the you know, constant topic of conversation. Uh, takes up a very large part of the television schedules, uh, a major topic of interest for very many people. But what you have to realize is that organized sport, as we understand it, is relatively historically recent. It didn't really exist until the late 18th or uh, early to mid 19th century. And how did it appear? Well, what happened was that a whole series of quite complicated institutions uh, appeared. Uh, but not without anybody design, with nobody designing them. It was not done in a top-down way. Nobody sat down in a committee and thought, oh, well, we'll create a sport of a certain kind and then create a body to administer it. It happened quite differently in a bottom-up way, which was driven purely by spontaneous order processes. So let's take the case of football. Now, back in the Middle Ages, uh, most parts of Europe played a game uh, that was sometimes called football. I've had various other kind of names in different parts of Europe, but there's a generic similarity. Basically, this was a game in which you didn't have two teams, you just had two large groups of people, could be any number of people. And the goal usually was to kick a ball, or sometimes a dead animal, uh, across a given line. And whichever team managed to do it in one direction was declared the winner. And it was basically more like a riot. Uh, it was basically an excuse for mass mayhem uh, and violence and beating the hell out of your neighbors. And some versions of this uh, game still survive. In Florence, for example, the Calcio, as it was called, which was the big annual football match in Florence, uh, still takes place and it's still taken very, very seriously. But this was an unorganized kind of game. There were no rules. There were no standard or uniform rules that will enable people from one part of the, uh, the Middle medieval Europe to play people from another part of medieval Europe in a recognized game, and there certainly weren't any sort of regulating or governing bodies. It was just basically a kind of excuse for having a lot of drink and, as I say, having a riot, essentially, which is one reason why kings were constantly trying to ban him. Now, what began to happen in the 17th century was that schools, in England in particular, began to play more organized uh, forms of this game. And what happened spontaneously at school after school was that a number of basic rules were drawn up, such as the number of players on each side, uh, in the shape and size of the ball, uh, the way you use the ground, or the shape, in one case, of the wall. This was famously at Eton. Uh, and things of that sort. And so the games played within these schools became now rule-bound. And the rules had been typically drawn up uh, by people at the school, typically in order to uh, make use of the fact that there was a certain kind of constraints of geography or number of pupils and that kind of thing. What then happened was that schools would start to play each other. The trouble was each school at this point typically had its own set of rules. And in the 18th century and the early 19th century, what began to happen was one of two things. The first was that schools would play matches against each other and they would agree to play by some set of rules. And what you found was that certain school sets of rules became adopted widely by other schools so that they could play each other more easily. The classic example of this was the rules that had been drawn up at rugby school in the Midlands to govern the kind of football that was played there, uh, and which therefore becomes, as we now know it, rugby football. The other thing was that a lots and lots of local teams would get together and would actually agree 
through a kind of sporting contract, or social contract, if you will, to a set of rules uh, and descriptions that would describe under what terms the game would be played. And so this was the origin, for example, of the Football Association, hence association football, or soccer, as the Americans and Australians call it. And so this happens in the early to mid 19th century. And then what you start to get is the emergence, in other words, of codes, quite elaborate legal systems, essentially, which describe how a game should be played, which lay down rules about things like the length of the time allocated for the match, uh, the shape and dimensions of the ground in which it was played, uh, the kind of rules about whether or not you're allowed to kick the ball or handle the ball, what you're allowed to do to the opposition, all this kind of thing, and also a mechanism for resolving disputes within the match, the introduction of the principle of referees, for example. Now, what this means is that you begin to get competition between codes. In other words, you start to find that uh, some codes are adopted by more and more uh, clubs or uh, schools. And these are actually typically gaining success because the more people support the particular code, the more likely it is that you'll have a wide range of opponents in the game, and so the more attractive it becomes as a kind of networking effect. On the other hand, uh, that each kind of set of rules determines the sort of game that will be played. So, for example, the rules originally developed at rugby school allowed the ball to be picked up and handled, and that produced quite a different kind of game to the rules adopted when the Football Association was set up, which obviously banned handling the ball entirely uh, and said you only had to actually you know, use your feet, which is why that's the correct uh, use of the term football. Uh, and so some kinds of rules were less popular, not just because they weren't widely adopted, but also because they produced a kind of game that wasn't uh, very, very popular. So, for example, the rules of Harrow School football, or the Eton Wall game and Eton football, never became widely popular, because they just were, did not produce a game that was attractive to a large number of people. So you start, therefore, to get, if you like, competition between codes. The next stage of the process was that uh, in addition to schools, private clubs are formed, spontaneous voluntary uh, associations. And what these then do is come together to form national bodies to set up a competitive league structure. And soon after that, they then in turn develop and set up national regulatory bodies, governments, if you will. Uh, and these are things like the FA, the Scottish Football Association, the Rugby Football uh, Association, uh, the Rugby Football League, which I'll come back to in a moment because that highlights a major feature of this kind of process. And these uh, then, in turn, regulate and run and uh, set up <coughs> national league competitions and the like. Final stage uh, in the development of, say, association football is the development of a world governing body. Uh, FIFA, which is set up in 1908, when national associations from all over Europe and South America get together and create a world regulating body. Uh, now, a couple of things to say about this. This is something I've been talking about football here, but you could equally tell the same story about racket sports, about hockey, uh, about equestrian sports, and in fact, about almost any kind of organized sport that there is out there. Now, what you have here is actually a very interesting economic and political process. You've got the spontaneous emergence through voluntary interaction, voluntary cooperation, voluntary association of a complex social order. An order which in many ways mimics many of the features of a political order or state. You have a legal order, a system of laws, actually called laws in the case of cricket, uh, but usually called rules everywhere else. Uh, but it essentially corresponds to the constitutional and legal rules of a political order. You have a regulatory and rule-setting body uh, at both national and international level, which corresponds, if you like, to a government of one kind or another. You also have a way of settling uh, disputes over the interpretation of the rules, both within the context of particular games, but then also through various kinds of appeal procedures uh, to the regulatory bodies uh, at a higher level. There's also um, an option for secession. I mentioned the Rugby Football League. Uh, what happened there was that the uh, clubs up in the north of England were mainly uh, composed of working men uh, who couldn't afford to play games on Saturday for free because in those days, Saturday was a half working day. 
And so the clubs up in the north, places like Wigan and Leeds, suggested that what they should do is pay people compensation, make up the loss of wages. And the chaps down south, uh, rather better off, who ran the rugby union, said, no, you can't have that. Uh, that means you're professionalising the game. And part of the principles of our game is that it's an amateur game. So what happened was that the rugby uh, uh, league broke away from the rugby union. And what they then did, as well as making it a professional game, uh, was to introduce a whole range of other innovations. They changed the basic uh, rules governing the sport. They got rid of second phase play, they introduced and they reduced the number of players on the team, they did a whole number of things to make the game more attractive to spectators, basically, uh, which is why rugby league is so much better than rugby union. But as a northerner, I would say that. Now, the, the point is, therefore, you have a secession option. Now, it's interesting, and I'll highlight this because I'll return to it later, of comparing this to politics. What you have uh, in the same sort of geographical area is competition between, if you like, different legal systems, different ways of organizing, in this case, competitive sport. You've also got innovation, very high levels of innovation, something again I'll return to, because the team, the governing bodies, the regulating bodies, uh, have a constant incentive to try and make their sport more attractive than other rival sports, because what they're doing is competing with other sports for the leisure time uh, and the playing time uh, of people who are interested in uh, sport, either as spectators or as participants. Uh, and the whole process leads, as I say, to the development of a really quite complicated uh, and sophisticated spontaneous order. And it's continued to develop. Uh, in the 1980s, for example, the International Olympic Committee, another example of one of these global bodies, set up the Court for Arbitration in Sport. Uh, they then spun this off and it became a completely independent private commercial body. It's based in Lausanne, but has courts in other places around the world as well as in Lausanne. And it deals with disputes uh, about sporting uh, regulation. It, uh, acts as an arbitration court, and it deals with disputes between sports, but typically within sports. Uh, a lot of doping cases go up to the court of arbitration. Also, lots and lots of cases within association football to do with transfer payments, uh, the way in which national associations or FIFA or other bodies have or have not enforced their own rules. The sort of standing, the ultimate court of appeal for all of that is the court of arbitration for sport. So you actually have a global legal order which governs all sports because virtually every organized sport is now signed up to refer disputes to the court for arbitration sport in Lausanne. Again, it works highly effectively. It's extremely efficient. Uh, the average time it takes for a major case to be decided by the CIS is typically less than six months, uh, which is you know, staggeringly efficient compared to most uh, national court systems. And there are still constant innovations uh, in the basic rules, quite often radical and dramatic ones. So as you may know, uh, in, the in the United States, they have a game that they call football, uh, which, you know, nothing like association football, um, developed actually out of rugby. And it developed out of rugby football mainly because of a series of innovations made before World War I by one man, actually, Walter Karp, uh, the football coach at Yale University in New England. And he's an example of a recurring phenomenon in uh, the world of organized sport, which is the role of what you might call uh, entrepreneurs, people who come up with new and novel ways of doing things. In the case of, uh, say, association football, the classic case is, first of all, the way in which FIFA, uh, in the end of the 1920s, decided to change the offside rule. Now, up until then, there had to be two outfield players plus the goalkeeper between you and the goal if you received a ball played forward to you. Uh, and they reduced it to one player plus the goalkeeper. And the result was, for a while, goals being scored like nobody's business. That's why if you look at pretty much any club in British football, all the record scores uh, and record totals of goals by players come from the late 1920s, early 1930s. Then, in the 1930s, a guy called Herbert Chapman, who had won the league title three times with Huddersfield Town, became the manager of Arsenal, and he completely transformed the way in which uh, football was played, initially in England and latterly around the world. Previously, there'd been a formation, um, basically a 2-3-5 formation, uh, which uh, is why all, we have all these positions, names on the field, which no longer make any kind of sense, like inside, right, and left, and all that kind of thing. And uh, he turned it into 4-4-2, well, 4-2-4, actually, uh, which later on becomes 4-4-2. Completely changed the way the game was played. Sport is extremely innovative. Sport 
structures are highly competitive with, the, with each other. And this whole order has been produced without any kind of planning. Uh, people, you, there's no case virtually of sport where people have literally sat down and thought about inventing a sport or imposing rules in this way. It's always happened in a bottom-up fashion. There is one major caveat to that, uh, which is that in Europe and most parts of the world, as I described it, national leagues and national associations are formed by clubs getting together and agreeing to set up a common body that will regulate them and control the competition that they're taking part in. In the United States in particular, but also in Australia, uh, certain sports are organized differently. And the way that has happened there is that a national body is set up first and it then creates local teams or franchises. That is actually quite important uh, because it creates a different set of incentives. One of the reasons why association football in Europe and Latin America is awash with money and yet most teams are broke uh, is because of the incentives created by the way the game has historically evolved, whereas the top-down uh, creation by spontaneously of a league, which then creates uh, lower-level teams, leads to a quite different set of incentives, which means that the Americans are much better controlling costs in sport uh, and regulating the financial side of things. Now, at this point, you may, you may say, but hold it, Davies. Uh, you're holding up this story, basically, of sports as not only being a spontaneous order, but as being something where if you compare it to government, uh, it's basically sport that comes out on top. Because sport, the way I am telling it, is more flexible, adaptable, and innovative than political systems. Uh, it is more competitive in the sense that you can s decide which, political, which sport you want to follow. Uh, you can actually break away quite easily and set up a new sport if you want to, as happened with rugby league. Uh, it's generally a much more adaptable and dynamic kind of order than the political order. So I'm basically singing the praises of sport uh, at the expense of the political order. But I'm sure you, some of you were thinking, what about FIFA? Uh, what about the International Olympic Committee until recently? Surely we can all remember that amazing moment a few weeks ago when a whole bunch of FIFA people uh, were led out of FIFA headquarters, or the hotel rather, in, in Switzerland, uh, to be uh, you know, made off as they couldn't refuse probably by the American criminal justice system. Well, indeed, that was highly entertaining. And personally, I'm uh, really looking forward to the, I, you know, the thought of Set Blatter uh, being brought out of FIFA headquarters in handcuffs. You know, I think I would make that my screensaver, basically. Uh, so what do I say about this? Well, interesting, actually. And this tells us something about one of the sort of challenges facing sport today. Uh, what are the two international governing bodies which have been most associated with corruption? And it's two, the International Olympic Committee uh, and more recently and spectacularly FIFA. What do those two sports have in common? And why is it that they therefore have corruption, whereas rugby union, rugby league, Australian rules football, tennis, cricket, although it's beginning to change there in cricket actually, do not? Uh, the answer is that they both run major tournaments which have become highly politicized. Uh, for some reasons, well, things to do with uh, status and prestige primarily, governments are very, very keen that their country host the Olympic Games or the FIFA World Cup. Now, economists have worked out many, many times that actually the benefit of this in economic terms uh, is either nil or negative. Essentially, what the Olympic Games do uh, is a wash. You get no net GDP gain from the Olympic Games. Uh, we were told when the London Olympics were held it was going to bring huge benefits to the London economy and by extension the UK economy. The latest figures that came out just recently were exactly as any economist would have predicted, it basically comes out neutral. The FIFA World Cup is actually a really bad thing to have. Uh, the last few FIFA World Cups have reduced aggregate GDP in the countries that have hosted them by about 2%. Uh, so it's a major hit actually to have the FIFA World Cup. And in fact, what the economists can't work out is exactly why that is. But despite this, governments are very, very keen to have them. And so the whole process uh, by which those major tournaments are allocated has now meant that the spontaneous order of sport and organized sport has gone, begun to interface with the quite different order of politics. And that's where the corruption mainly comes from. It doesn't come from the role of corporate sponsors or sponsorship. 
because you have just a very, very large amounts of corporate sponsorship in, say, for example, uh, the Rugby World Cup or the Cricket World Cup, but there's no evidence that there have been similar kind of decisions uh, influenced by political processes in that case. Cricket is perhaps beginning to show slight signs of that, uh, of, of a, a politicization and corruption. This reflects one sort of problematic feature of that sport, which is the fact that it's increasingly dominated by one particular part of the world, which is the Indian subcontinent, and particularly India. There is another, uh, there are other challenges, of course. Uh, doping is a challenge. My own view about that is that actually sports should bite the bullet and uh, allow people to uh, use performance enhancing substances. Uh, and uh, maybe you know, some of you might have answer, you know, questions for me about that, but that, that's my own position on that particular issue. Um, another issue is the one of gambling uh, and the role of, of gambling syndicates in then trying to fix the outcome of games and matches. Uh, this again is a serious challenge, but it's one which actually I think sports are proving pretty good at resolving. So what I'd sort of like to wrap up by saying, conclude by saying, is quite simply this. You may think that sport is literally just a leisure activity, and indeed, of course, that's precisely what it is, but it's a very big business, and it's something that plays a hugely important part in many people's lives. Uh, for many people I know, actually, probably the most important thing in their lives. And that's right, and that's to, to judge by the way they behave anyway. Uh, and what, uh, what you will find when you think about it, and you look at it through the point of view of an economist, and particularly a Hayekian economist, is that actually this is a kind of way of organizing complex human affairs, in this case sporting activities, that is quite different and in contrast to the way in which we organize our political affairs, even though there are actually very pronounced similarities in other ways, such as a form of a social contract, the development of uh, governance institutions and the like, and it's one that is actually in all kinds of ways more innovative, more dynamic, more effective than the kind of things you get through the conventional political process. Uh, so at that point I'll stop uh, and invite uh, questions from, from you all. Yep. <laughs> Just